folks, this is all going to be a little rambly. It is as titled Some Thoughts on Tech Leadership. Um, all the words are very ambiguous, to put it mildly. What does tech mean? For this talk, I'm broadly referring to digital technologies, software, hardware, data, uh, what you see around you that enables mobile phones and other software and uh, robotics and things. And leadership, it has a lot of dimensions. And for this talk, I will focus on just one dimension. And that doesn't mean that others are not important, but I will call out one um, and happy to dig deeper into any other aspects that you would like. As far as the structure of the talk is concerned, I'm going to share a couple of hypotheses slash observations that are the basis for the suggestions. And uh, feel free to disagree with everything and it would be wonderful to have a debate. Uh, if you take away the hypotheses, a lot of the suggestions stop making sense. So I will first call out the hypotheses and then tell you what are the things that, uh, that I'm suggesting in retrospect to somebody who's a young person entering the area of tech with the intention of uh, becoming a leader over time. Um, so first and foremost, tech is driving all decisions. And I've just drawn out a little bit of a semi-cartoonish view of how that has changed. If you look at the extreme left-hand side, in the 1995 uh, pre-internet era, tech was mainly limited to enterprise decisions. It's still doing that. And in fact, doing so ever more. So this is an ever increasing set. Nothing has been replaced. Stuff has just been added on. So in the mid nineties, uh, where I think a lot of you might not have been born then. So these memories would be very non-existent. Uh, tech was restricted to making enterprise decisions. Uh, how are companies shipping stuff? How are they doing HR? What is the supply chain? That kind of stuff. Uh, 1995 to let's say 2005 timeframe, uh, let's call it the era of the home internet, where people had uh, landlines, dial-in lines, modems, and things were restricted to low bandwidth activities. There was no video, there was no chatting, very little chatting. Uh, and things were mostly around how can you do things a little more efficiently? News started getting delivered instead of in print. You saw a newspaper that looked like the physical newspaper, but came on the net. Uh, you had started doing some shopping and there was very limited movie watching. Some television shows had started moving. It was mainly how some things were done had started moving over to the net. Then the 2005 era, 2005 to 2015, 2020, uh, pretty much started by the launch of the iPhone by Apple. It made the internet break out of the home and enter people's hands. So, and price points got driven down from the price of a computer to the price of a phone. And that has made the net or technology also, I'm saying tech and, uh, and the net, uh, kind of, uh, I'm conflating the two, which is not entirely accurate, but for my purposes is good enough. It's made it ubiquitous in that everybody has access to tech. In fact, those who don't have access to tech are in trouble to the point that uh, if you want to fill in a government form, let's say you want to get a passport, you're forced to deal with tech, even if you don't want to, or are not capable of, or don't have the resources. Um, in COVID, education is an outstanding example. It has made tech ubiquitous. And interestingly, the thing that has changed on the dimension of decisions is now tech is deciding for us what to buy. It is not telling us how to do things, but what to do things. For example, your social feed determines what you read. The targeting algorithm that the Zomato team might have put in place will give you three recommendations on what you should eat today. Google search engine will probably tell you what brand of shoes, when you started looking for shoes, uh, should you be considering. And these personalization algorithms have become powerful enough that you're reading about the companies like Facebook and so on and so forth that are pretty much determining what you should read. So whoever is a conservative, in their political views is being given conservative stuff to read and they have very little chance of breaking out of that and who's liberal is getting liberal and so on and so forth. So from the how, the what has started getting taken over by tech. 
And personalization is a huge driver of that. And from there, we are headed into even who I am. And this is embedded tech, the metaverse, a lot of what gaming does, a lot of what social media is doing to people already. If I'm hanging out with people on my friends group or the Instagram people that I follow, and I'm sorry, I don't use too much social media. So you will find that some of the words that I use are somewhat funny and uh, probably nonsensical, but conceptually stay with me. It ends up defining who I am. You might have heard that the people that you hang out with is what you become. And social media and the net gives you a very selective view of who you hang out with. It gives you a very selective view of the products that you should be looking at, a selective view of the news that you should be reading. And even who you are or who I am is getting defined by tech. Take away from this, tech drives continuous change. Just in your lives where you probably have been using phones over the last 10 years, think back at how much has changed. And India is a crucible for seeing that change. In the last five years alone, I suspect banking has changed, shopping has changed, news has changed, gaming has changed at an incredible pace. It also drives enormous value. Look at the market caps of the startups in the tech world. There is a new unicorn being born between the time that we start this talk and end this talk. But it all comes at huge personal, I'm calling it risk, cost, demands, whatever it is. And that is indeed the part of the complement to the opportunity that I want to talk about. So tech gives a lot, but also asks a lot of each one of us. And I've drawn a few of these wacky pictures. If you think of a tree as being me or you, a tech gives us a lot of fruits, but it demands that our roots be very deep. If we think ourselves as a fancy building, yes, we can keep adding more and more stories, but we better have very deep foundations. If we think of a cargo ship, which can carry more and more load as being a good analogy for one of us, where we have more and more opportunity, we better also have a fair bit of depth to us. Otherwise we'll become top heavy, top heavy and potentially capsize or roll over and stuff like that. It's this hidden portion that does not get exposed or talked about in the tech world. And I will talk a little bit about both the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree. So upsides are huge opportunity, value creation, thrill. Downsides are turbulence of all the change that happens, the land keeps shifting. My father used to be in the armed forces. His job barely changed over the 30 years that he was part of the armed forces. In As a tech person, I have already had, God knows, 20 job descriptions in the 20 years that I have been at work partly because I am a little bit of a crazy guy, but partly because tech changes very quickly. The social pressure, tools for manipulation, personalization that we've already talked about dilutes identity. It even becomes hard to identify who I am if I identify myself with my phone and then my friends keep defining who I am and they keep changing their minds. And as a result, I get whiplash. So strong grounding is needed not only in tech leaders, but in all of us. And the choice that turns out is, do I control tech? to take advantage of these upsides or does tech control me so that I'm dealing with these downsides predominantly. Any questions? Shall I keep marching on? Okay. No questions so far. Yeah. Okay. So suggestion number one. So I'll move over from the hypotheses to the suggestions. One is invest early in personal growth and y'all are barely in college. Y'all are trying to figure out, hey, should I study biotech? How will I get my first job? So at one level, the suggestion might feel like you've got to be nuts, but start early. And the good news is there are a lot of young people I meet. I'm about 55. So when I say young people, I'm talking of maybe people in their 20 to 30s who are actually investing in this. And believe me, most of the folks that I was with when we were your age did not make this investment. So Maybe to me, it seems that this is something worth pointing out to you. It probably seems like we're already doing this. So this is old hat, in which case, wonderful. If not, please pay heed. Invest early in personal growth. Learn about ethics, philosophy, religion, some other random subjects. And why I say this is when you have the kind of power that tech gives you, you need to be able to have a personal grounding in figuring out the answers to questions like, what Mark Zuckerberg is faced with. Where should you draw the line in allowing free speech 
or what the Twitter folks are faced with, or what any of the other companies that you see in India are faced with, that because you have reach that runs into the hundreds of millions of people, and that is not the time to be growing up. It has to start early. Have personal coaches, family, friends, colleagues, who you can use as sounding boards, who you believe are vested in your growth. Cultivate first principles thinking. I say this because the rules of the game keep changing. So you better start figuring out how to think from first principles. If somebody tells you, hey, it's a wonderful thing to go throw slander at the following person because they are considered an extremist either on the religious dimension or on the nationalist dimension, think about it from first principles because you might find that these three people are misinformed, whether it's lynching somebody who's supposedly stolen a cow to all the way, how do you make a product decision? First principles thinking applies across the board. And take your time in these investments. You will all be in a rush that I need to get out of college. I need to figure out how to get a job. And some of us might not have that choice because we are on loans. We need the money. There could be other constraints. But those of us who do have a choice, or even if it stretches you a little, take more time in college rather than less time. A lot of people will tell you, hey, that 23-year-old has become a successful entrepreneur. That's okay. I can point you to several 45-year-olds who are successful entrepreneurs. There is no rush. Take time to get a good grounding, get these deep roots, get the good foundation, get that depth under the water before you wander out into the turbulence and opportunity that the tech world is. So if you spend an extra year in college, okay, the pace of change, the sensory overload, they demand this early investment. Uh, Sanat, a question that you want to bring up? Yeah. Uh, so okay. we have a question from Nikhil who's asking, I mean, considering personal growth may not be a linear process, how do we know that we are in the right direction, especially when people around you think that you're, you're crazy? Yes. So the last bit, which is people around you think you're crazy, is actually a proxy for the personal growth. I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, I was at IIT Kanpur. There were 10 of us that were together in one group. One of the guys decided that the rest of us were intolerable, and we were intolerable. Um, we were highly juvenile. This guy was focused on uh, improving his health, reading philosophy, and we used to laugh at him. So he just quit the group, and he left. And he was lampooned for four years. And when I look back, I think he was the bravest of the lot. The rest of us were a bunch of clowns. It took us many, many years to grow up, to realize what he was talking about. So at one level, personal growth in large measure is realizing that you and me as an individual can have priorities different than the mob. And this is a feedback loop. So to answer your question, how do we know we are on the correct path? One of it might be, you will get laughed at. That is probably a leading indicator. But the other one is keep asking yourself that am I doing stuff in this direction? Because the very awareness of wanting to do stuff in this direction will actually lead you to reading, absorbing, conversing. So you can't give up your professional path uh, purely for personal growth. This has to be an add-on. This is like when you get up and go for a run, you run two miles every few days, that kind of stuff. This is along those lines. Keep an awareness of it. You will have to deal with folks thinking that you are a little off the norm. But believe me, most people who believe that the other person is a little wacky also believes that there is something to be emulated there. And part of being, if you will, courageous, and I will come to that in a few moments, you've kind of touched upon something that I plan to talk about. You will find that you have to figure out what are some things that you are willing to do with your friends and some things that you are willing to do without your friends? So sorry, it's not a very precise answer. The answer being one, figure out how to deal with it. And two, just by virtue of being aware that there is this need, you will find that the journey will go on. And it's a matter of just starting it early because it's an endless journey. It will never end, uh, this notion of personal growth. Uh, and a whole pe bunch of people... Uh, even at the age of 85, are exactly in the same quest that you can start. Paul, I'm suggesting it started at 18 or 19. Okay. Second suggestion, which is very relevant to the question that you raised, because believe me, that is something that all of us deal with, me included, and most of the people, and we all deal with it in different degrees. 
overcome fear. The reason why I said overcome fear as opposed to saying take risk, and I'm saying AKA take, take risk, but overcome fear is a more fundamental building block in my mind. Fear is of all kinds. And let's come to the first point later. Let's go to the later one. Get out of your comfort zone. Do new activities. Travel, eat new food. Make acquaintances. And I'm saying that we all value friends. And often friends become a way of escaping random conversations, hanging out with people. Set aside some time to meet with people that you have no intention of making friends with. Because acquaintances demand resilience. They will say things that your friends will probably get away with more easily. With acquaintances, you will learn how to take on unfamiliar stuff. Friends provide comfort. So make acquaintances. Put yourself in a position to fail, especially when there are low stakes. I'm not saying jump off a 20-story building. Try wacky projects that you know will not work out. Accept your mistakes. The moment one starts accepting mistakes, you will find that the ability to conquer fear and all kinds of other dimensions literally begins to melt away. We all want to look good. Get over that. Nobody cares. Most people are worried about looking good themselves. When you go to a party thinking how well-dressed you are, what do you think is going on in everybody else's head? They're all thinking how well-dressed they are. So very few people are that worried about other people. So don't take yourself too seriously. Sing in parties, okay? Even Especially if you suck, because that is yet another fear to go on with. So figure out how do you overcome fear. Asta, please go ahead. So I don't think we'll be able to have Asta ask a question directly. If you can just post it in the Q&A box, Asta. Okay. So in the meanwhile, I'll keep marching, given the time is short. And then we'll get, as soon as Asta asks right. a question, please interrupt me. Okay. Another suggestion, and this is while I've said lead, please keep in mind that we are all leaders. That is the other thing to keep in mind. The size of the band that we lead might change, but you are leaders in different ways at different points. So even when we say leaders, please accept the fact that there is opportunity to lead at all points in time. You go home, you find that a discussion is going in a direction that you don't think is healthy, opportunity to lead. We start from the self, go to family, friends, community, the world at large. A leader and all of us need to start thinking in a larger and larger oval because the world is really, really suffering from thinking of a smaller and smaller piece. And this has been true always. This is not just about tech. So, and this is a way of thinking. This is not just about business. This is about business, charity, government, education. When you go out for dinner, if there is one person who is always reluctant to voice their opinion, be the leader in that scenario and solicit the input of this one person who's usually very shy and therefore is forced to eat alu paratha because somebody who's a lot more vocal and vehement always likes alu paratha. Figure out how do you go eat whatever chicken Manchurian, um, and I'm a vegetarian, so don't ask me where chicken Manchurian came from. Um, if that is what this person, yet another opportunity for leadership. So think wider than, as wide in a circle as possible. And Sanat, if we have Asta's question, we can jump to that. Uh, not from Asta, but we do have two questions. One of which I think you've answered, which is how to get time for self-growth. And Jeet. the other is if you can elaborate on the idea of intellectual honesty. Uh, intellectual honesty. So intellectual honesty is one of my favorite topics. I have my email ID written before. If you want to engage on that, I can bore you to death. Um, so intellectual honesty is basically accepting facts without trying to fool yourself into denying them. So for example, um, I sing badly is being intellectually honest. I made a mistake. Try get as close to facts. This is not about beating yourself up. This is just about trying to get as close to facts as you can. And a lot of things get in the way of being intellectually honest. Very often, let's say my mom, when I'm a kid, asks, oh, who dropped this plate? Now, okay, if I drop this plate, chances are I'm going to get a slap. So the temptation is to say, I didn't. That would be an example of intellectual honesty. 
So honesty is, of course, honesty. Intellectual honesty is to be honest to yourself first, and then honesty goes to other people. The most effective liars are people who lie to themselves because then they're not even lying to others. So that is the trap to avoid. And by no means am I suggesting a negative connotation. I do mean intellectual honesty. So intellectual honesty means be as honest to yourself as you can, and then you will find that it radiates out from you to all other circumstances surrounding you. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Gupta, just, just a reminder that if we can wrap up in five minutes. Okay. So yeah. learn multiple areas is not a big deal. Uh, where does passion fit into this? I do want to touch upon this. One of the things that we are constantly told is do what you're passionate about. Do what you're passionate about. I always struggle with that advice. I'm 55. I don't know what I'm passionate about. I know many people who are 55, even older, they don't know what they're passionate about. And we tell an 18 year old to figure out what are you passionate about? And then we tell them, you don't know what you're passionate about. And there will be some dude in our entire group of friends and she knows what she's passionate about. And the rest of us feel like shit that if uh, Savitri knows what she's passionate about, what the hell do I not know? So good news is the vast majority of the world doesn't know what they're passionate about. In fact, you can be passionate about many things. And it usually takes time to identify your passion. People will figure out they're passionate about singing, but you can't afford to sing because you can't afford to pay your bills. So even if you know what you're passionate about, you can't follow it. So I wanted to touch upon some practical advice on where does passion fit into this whole business of building a career slash blah, blah, blah. My recommendation is this graph. First, let's deal with the right hand side. Commit to something that you are good at because when you spend time on something, this blue line begins to kick in. When you spend time, the probability of liking it keeps going up. When you're good at something, people tell you, ah, oh, man, you play good cricket. And you say, oh, now I'm going to play a little more. And soon you find that the positive feedback loop of what you're good at begins to start saying, you know, I like this stuff. Also, the probability of disliking something is very high in the beginning and then actually comes down. The financial stability goes up when you stick with something. So my recommendation is, Commit to something that you're good at. That might become the passion. Even if it doesn't become the passion, it will give you the staying power and the ability to experiment and figure out something that you are actually passionate about and then commit to it. You buy time. So don't be under the gun to find your passion in the next three years if you're graduating in three years or in the next two years or whatever it is. Find something that you are good at, that you enjoy relatively, and give yourself time to find passion. Some of us die without ever finding it. If we are lucky, we find it. And if you find it, go follow it. And then you will be in the vanishingly small percent. But don't let this become a load upon your shoulder. One last point, and then we'll move on. This is a part of the previous one. Become an expert as time goes on. In the first six, seven years, explore. This could maybe give you aha moment, in which case you start doing it. I had that aha moment. I left my first two jobs in nine months each. Then I became an entrepreneur and that was my aha moment that I like this stuff. And I've stayed an entrepreneur ever since I got dumb lucky. It could have been many years since I continued to go on, but then go deep, commit time. Unless you go deep, you don't become good at stuff. You don't get staying power and you could be deep in a lot of different ways. And this then gives you the ability, the time to find your passion. And if you ever find your passion, go do it. If you don't find your passion, keep doing whatever it is that you're good at. So here we are. Summary, you have enormous power by virtue of tech. Tech is redefining the world. I think you see that all around you. Question is, how do you prepare for it? Overcome fear that will prepare you to take risks. Ground yourself so that your feet stay squarely on Mother Earth. Have a wider group to pay attention to other than yourself. Think long term. Don't think short term. You have time. You will work for 50 years. Even if you take two years extra in educating yourself, you'll work for 48 years. Believe me, 48 years is a long time. 50 years is not much longer. And happy to, and disagreements are especially welcome. 